So today, I'm going to show you how I turned a standard Super Nintendo controller to one with a Raspberry Pi Zero installed inside, with an HDMI cable coming out the top and a battery in it as well, um, which you can plug directly into a TV with no additional parts needed. Um, it has a charging port on the bottom, a power switch on the top, and it's a pretty fun little project. A uh, nice way to learn how to solder and work with electronics. So let's get started. So here's a set of the tools and materials I used. I have a vise for holding circuit boards, uh, a set of helping hands for holding wire when you're trying to solder them, some solder of course, some solder cleaning wire, a set of uh, solid core wire itself, uh, some sanding sticks, a solder sucker, a wire clipper, uh, electrical tape, a wire stripper, pliers, a set of um, tweezers, an exacto knife, a sharpie, um, used for just kind of marking up cuts, uh, a solder and iron of course, some solder wick, and a standard Phillips head screwdriver. So here's some additional materials I used. Uh, I have a SNS-005 uh, Super Nintendo controller. Um, this one's pretty easy to wire up directly, so I'll show you how that kind of works later on in this. Um, of course, some command strips you could see here. I use those on the back of the controller as well as to hold the Raspberry Pi down inside the controller. Very useful. Um, the Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, SD card, I'm using an 8GB, um, really depends on the size, of the amount of games you want to put onto this thing. 8GB um, is probably good enough for the systems that the Pi Zero supports. Underneath this here is a, uh, a PowerBoost 500C from Adafruit. It's used to charge this battery over here and supply power to the Pi itself. And I have that hooked up to a standard slide switch right here, which I soldered directly to the PowerBoost. Um, and then this is just a 500 milliamp battery from Adafruit. It gives about, um, let's see, about two and a half hours of charge I tested yesterday. So you can play just fine. Also, uh, I've cut a little hole down here so you could charge, uh, charge it up as well, which I'll show you later on in the video. Um, so that's it. That's, the, that's all the parts uh, end to end. And uh, let's start taking apart this controller and show you how I did it. So the first thing that I kind of ended up having to do was figure out how I was going to fit all this stuff inside the controller. So first step is really just kind of mapping out your space. Um, as you can see inside of this controller here, there's just a plain circuit board. So there's a lot of kind of uh, space to work with here from placing parts. However, see this wiring harness here? This is a little too high to give me clearance for putting the Raspberry Pi Zero here. Um, so this is something I kind of looked at initially and said, you know what, I probably have to remove that. The good news about that is if you look at the actual circuit board itself, that harness in the back is connected to these pins up front, um, which actually helps later on in the project when you're thinking about how will I wire the Raspberry Pi up to the actual button controls. Um, this gives you a nice easy way to do it. You don't have to worry about wiring to each individual uh, uh, button on the side. You could just wire it to these pins, um, so there's five pins. And I'll have the wiring diagram uh, in the description below. Um, but that actually makes this pretty straightforward to do and gives you a nice set of uh, space to work with on the back here. Um, the next thing that I kind of did is just use a standard sharpie marker. And you can see here, uh, you might be able to see in the finished product here. Um, uh, probably not. But basically, I just laid these things out here and kind of use a Sharpie marker to kind of draw out where I'd want them to sit as well. So that placement became pretty straightforward at the end of the day. Um, and uh, it's now like just a nice little self-contained unit here. But you could see, it's actually maybe hard to see, but like right in here, um, but underneath here is where I'm kind of wiring the pins directly to these pinouts right here. And you could see they're wired directly into the Raspberry Pi's kind of GPIO pins. Um, also, as you can see from a space perspective, these things wouldn't be able to sit flush um, next to each other. So I had to raise the Pi Zero up just a little bit. Um, to do that, uh, I was telling you before about command strips. There is just a command strip right in here to kind of hold the Pi Zero. And that gives me just enough clearance over the power boost to kind of keep them um, from conflicting with each other. And to hold the power boost down, uh, I'm using basically Sugru, um, Sugru Putty to kind of stick that in place as well so that it doesn't move. And the battery just kind of has this nice place to hang out here. Uh, I didn't stick this down just in case I need to change the battery out. As you can see, the battery is just held up with a standard, um, standard JST connector. Um, okay, let me show you how this thing is wired. 
Um, so from a wiring perspective, uh, what I first did was kind of plan out the power circuit. So let's just move, move this for a second. Um, the power circuit is simply just this battery to this power boost to this switch. Um, so your first, the first step in the project should probably be from a wiring perspective, just getting that sorted out. Um, it's pretty straightforward at the end of the day. On the power boost, um, you have, let's see, you have positive and negative, which are going to the Pi. You need to worry about those secondary. The first thing you should worry about is basically wiring up the battery to these pins on the power boost itself. Um, black goes to ground and red goes to, I believe it's uh, five volts, uh, EN, sorry. Um, I'll put a wiring diagram in the, in the description as well for, for this. Uh, once that's wired up, you should be able to just switch this on. Let me take this out so I don't turn the power on as well. Um, and now, you know, see that the battery kind of comes on as well. Okay. Um, and also from a placement perspective, you start to think about where you want these things to sit. So I knew kind of going in that I wanted to be able to have access to be able to charge this thing. And I knew I wanted an HDMI port coming out of the top. Um, so that kind of kind of set up where things should go inside the controller. So this is going to go at the bottom of the controller for charging in. This is going to go to the top of the controller for charging out. Uh, some of the things this doesn't do, which I wish it would, uh, maybe in the next phase, uh, next, is you know there's no space to kind of jump and tie into these things here. So if I wanted to kind of hook in uh, more ROMs or more games um, or do other things with the Pi directly, I kind of have to open it up, uh, which is not terrible because you're not going to really do that too often. Um, but yeah, that's basically planning out your board. Once you have the power selector kind of uh, hooked up, the next phase would basically be wiring the power boost to the Raspberry Pi itself. And that's where you have these positive and negative pins up here. And those map to the 5 volt and ground pins on the Pi, GPI of the Pi. Once you have that circuit complete, that's powered. Um, you could basically do anything you want just with the Pi itself. Now. The next part I'll talk about is how I wire the actual um, buttons on the controller here, the specifically these pins, um, these pins right here, to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so let's get to that next. So to spacing again, um, the standard Super Nintendo controller has this stuff on the back here, and this is primarily used to keep the buttons themselves kind of pressed in place so they have a, have a good action on them when you're pressing down. Um, but you can see, just looking at this here, this is basically the space where I'd want to store the Raspberry Pi along with the charging cable and the battery. Um, so you have to remove this stuff. Uh, here's what I ended up doing with um, my controller. You can see it's kind of dirty still, but um, removed this here, removed uh, this pin here because it's not needed as a post, that as well. Um, this you're going to end up needing to remove up here to get the HDMI cable through. Um, and there's a post down here for another screw hole. We actually don't end up needing it. Um, the other four screws are enough to keep the thing closed in place where this doesn't really give you that much extra support. So you can remove that as well. And the benefit of that is it gives you a little kind of hole for some venting. Um, probably not enough. I'm probably going to want to add some more venting holes right here. Uh, but yeah, that's basically cleaning up the back of the case right there so that you could um, store the Raspberry Pi Zero and everything nice and, uh, nice and fit. The good news is as you can see from a space perspective, um, this basically has enough uh, enough height here to give the bat the buttons on the front the um, the the pressure they need to have good action. So don't worry about removing these as long as you have this stuff in place. Uh, trust me, it's going to fit just fine. Um, uh, so that's it. Uh, thanks very much. So how did I figure out how to wire this thing up? Um, basically, going from this harness here to this kind of uh, set of wires down here. Um, simple answer is a lot of research. Um, I knew off the bat that the, the distribution that I wanted to install on this Raspberry Pi called RetroPi has, uh, has drivers that you can install for interfacing with the GPIO pins of the board. Um, so I started here just to see kind of what it supported. Um, but before that, I started just researching uh, what the pinouts from this board were so like what is you know what does each one of these pins correspond to and i found this um this great tutorial here for converting a super nintendo controller into a usb controller um, and it basically fit the same needs so right here you could see it kind of tells you exactly what these things match up to 
And this information is, is really important for when you're kind of finally wiring this up to the, to the Raspberry Pi. So structurally you have uh, from, let's see, let's go from left to right. Brown is ground. Um, I'll actually hold this up here so we can see them together. Uh, <clears throat> red is data. Orange is latch. Yellow is clock. And white is power, basically. Um, so once you know that, you could start to map out exactly how you might map this to the board here. Um, so let's see if I could show you how this is set up. So, you know, going from, from front to back here. Uh, I didn't have enough yet color cable, so basically what I ended up doing is uh, black is ground and red is power, and then in between we have data, <coughs> data latch and clock. And how those end up mapping up to the Pi itself uh, was basically researched here. So let's go to this blog post was super helpful um, from Blue Blog, uh, basically kind of talking through how the GPIO driver works, what pins you should use on the Pi. Um, so I totally recommend reading this, um, and I'll put the put the details in the description below to show you how it works. And then I also kind of use this as a reference for oops, sorry, I wrote this one. This for a reference for the actual pins of the Pi itself. So if you remember before, um, <clears throat> we had mapped up the power boost to this five volt and this ground pin at the top row here. Um, now for the for the actual controller. Uh, you don't need five volts. So the power basically gets mapped to the 3.3 uh, uh, volt uh, here. Um, data is this pin right here underneath. And then ground, I had to find a different ground pin because I was already using this ground pin up here. Not a big deal, there's a few. I ended up using uh, this pin right here. And then clock and latch kind of at the, at the um, 10 and 11 pins at the end here. So I'll just put a wiring diagram in the description so you can see. Um, but that's it. Once you have these wired up, um, the soldering is pretty straightforward. Uh, basically pull the pins through the top here, uh, strip them off at the top, solder them down and clip the excess, and do the same thing on the Pi. Um, and I did this basically the same thing for the power boost here. And then just use electrical tape to cover stuff up. So if I go to, if I pull this up again on the bottom, you'll see kind of at the bottom here, I just have some electrical tape covering that up. Um, I probably should use um, some glue Hot glue, uh, for now it seems pretty okay. Um, I'll probably want to put some electrical tape down there as well so you can clean up those, just in case those short out. Um, but that's it, once you have that, and once you have those things wired up, um, the last part of this is really just software. And from a software perspective, um, that's where, let's see, oops. That's where this blog post comes in, uh, comes in super helpful. This is a readme file for the GPIO driver. And then this blog post is basically how this person, uh, how this guy did it. Um, uh, he did it with a six, Nintendo 64 controller, which you could adapt pretty easily to a Super Nintendo controller down here. Um, that's it. Um, so I'll put some di diagrams in the description and uh, hope that helps. Thanks so much. So what I haven't talked about yet um, from the beginning of the how-to is we talked about how to basically plan how everything was going to be spaced out and fit. Um, what I haven't showed you is how that kind of mapped out to how some of the external external ports are exposed. Um, this is where the X-Acto knife came in and the marker. Um, basically, what you end up doing is trying to find like a, the best place for all the stuff that you have kind of squeezed inside of this controller. Um, and your best bet is to kind of hold it up, you know, get this thing kind of built in, cut out, uh, or use marker basically right here to kind of mark out where this thing is going to sit inside the controller. As you can see, I was maybe playing with the idea of having it on this side at one point. Um, and once you have it kind of drawn out and marked out, just use the X-Acto knife to kind of cut it out. Um, you can see I've done the same thing at the top here. Um, you can see where I got a little uh, excessive here and need to basically fill that out. It's a modeling putty, um, which is okay. I mean, your idea is basically to give yourself enough space to kind of put this thing together. Um, and all I need to do now in the future is basically clean this up with some modeling paste or putty and uh, we'll be good to go. And the HDMI cable, uh, I, I initially made a mistake with this where I thought I wanted just to have this cable coming out. But at the end of the day, um, if this is always going to be kind of stationary inside, uh, having a little bit of the actual port itself sitting inside the controller is not so bad, um, which is what I found out, found out when putting this together. So to do that, basically, I kind of measured the width of this thing or the height of it, and 
kind of map that height to the actual controller itself to cut away, as you can see here, uh, cut away a space for it. And then I just sanded that down with the sanding sticks and uh, everything fit together. And now just kind of putting it together, it's a little, it's definitely a little more snug than a standard controller because of all those wires, um, but it fits together pretty nicely, pretty, pretty snugly as well. Um, and one thing I haven't called out yet are these like three holes that I drilled here. As you can see on the power boost itself, there's some small LEDs on this thing. Uh, they're hard to see here, but at the top you have a an LED that shows kind of the when it's powered on. This is a low battery indicator down here, and then this is a there's a charging indicator down under there as well. So what I ended up doing is drilling holes for those, so you could see kind of um, you know where uh, when it was turned on, what the power if the power was on, if the <coughs> if it was charging, and if it, the battery was low. So if you see this now. It's hard to see in this light here, but you can kind of see a little LED there. Um, and then just for kicks, uh, command strip again to make this thing easily portable. Put this on this on the back here so you can kind of have a nice little self-contained um, controller. And that's it. Um, so I'm gonna go plug this into the TV and show you how it works. All right, so this is my monitor. I got the controller, of course, and just gonna hook this up through HDMI, which is this cable right here. And all I need to do now is just power this on, and that should do it. Now this does take a little bit of time to boot. Um, Raspberry Pi Zero is not as powerful, let's say, as a uh, you know Raspberry Pi Two or Three. Um, so from a performance perspective, it is a little slower, um, which means more time to boot, more time to switch things around, and also um, it doesn't run every system well. Um, probably get good traction out of like things up to it, including the Super Nintendo and Genesis. Um, anything above that though, and uh, it will it will slow. It'll not perform well. Um, so let's see. See, it's taking a little bit of time, about maybe a minute left. Um, there we go. Get into my first boot, first boot sequence here. And in a second, you should see the emulation station screen. So this is running RetroPie uh, version 3.8, uh, runs really well. <clears throat> um, let's see what else. Uh, systems wise that I have on here now, I've, you know I'm I'm more nostalgic for Super Nintendo. That's what I grew up with. Um, but I have NES on here, Genesis, um, and some Game Boy Advance as well. Uh, but you can see and Game Gear too. Um, but you know button presses kind of map out directly as well. Um, let's see, starting a game, press A, of course, get into that system there. Let's turn on F0, and the audio should work as well. Let's see. There you go. And what's cool about this is, whoops, sorry. As you're playing, of course, buttons all work. Um, Grand Prix, let's see. One of my favorite games ever. Um, but all these should work fine. So left and right buttons. I'm not doing well just because I want to show you the buttons themselves. That's boost, of course, all that stuff works. And what's cool about this is you can press select and let right here to save a state. You can see at the bottom left. And you can press and hold select and press L to load that state. And then to exit the emulator, you just press select and hold start. And it takes you back out to RetroPie. So a nice little, um, yeah, a really nice little self-contained um, portal game system. You can see as it's going back um, to RetroPie, it does take a little bit longer as well to return. But yeah, once you have that in place, um, there you go. You're done. Hope that helps. Hope you have fun and hope you build your own. Thanks so much.